welcome everybody to today's talk. I'm really happy today to introduce Dr. Adeline Leung, uh, who is a faculty member in the Department of Veterinary Biomedical Sciences at the University of Saskatchewan in Cadmet. A bit of her academic history. So she got her bachelor and master degrees at McMaster University, uh, where she learned, where she started learning uh, about protein crystallography. Uh, and after a brief parenthesis as a research assistant, she then pursued her PhD in Dr. Nagai's laboratory, which is uh, located in the Laboratory of Molecular Biology of the Medical Research Council in Cambridge, UK. It's one of the prestigious laboratories uh, over there. Uh, in there, she studied, she contributed to the structure of some of the components of the spliceosome. I guess she will talk a little bit about that later. She then moved to, uh, to the US for a postdoctoral position in the laboratory of Dr. Kravitz uh, at the Harvard Medical School in the Department of Neurobiology. Uh, she wanted to learn more about in vivo methodologies there, and she studied uh, the neural mechanisms of innate behaviors in Drosophila. What she's doing now with her group is to uh, trying to understand how molecular structures facilitate the development and functioning of neural circuits that govern behaviors. Uh, just a few words about uh, today's talk. Um, during the past year, we were very busy uh, worrying about our research interest and perhaps worrying about uh, COVID and all these things. But many other uh, exciting scientific things were happening and very likely one of the most important of those is uh, the story that Adeline is going to tell us today. Uh, perhaps the first example uh, of uh, artificial intelligence helping to solve one of the biggest problems in the life sciences, a problem that was dated you know, from, from the 50s, from the 60s of the last century. and so something very big and considered very difficult to solve. So I'm really glad that we have our talking today, also because it's a nice coincidence that uh, worldwide we are celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Protein Data Bank, which is the repository where all the structures of the proteins are, um, are conserved for you know, uh, open use. So no more words. Adeline, please uh, go on with your presentation. Thank you very much for your introduction. I was a bit surprised that you'd start with uh, uh, Spanish in the beginning, so that's, I'm glad you converted to English so I know when to start. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so much for inviting me to give this talk. Um, as, uh, as you know, I uh, switched field into neurobiology and uh, structural biology is something um, I'm still working on, but uh, this opportunity gave me a good uh, opportunity to kind of look at what's happening um, uh, most recently, especially with AlphaFold. So I'm going to start with, um, oops, I guess I should, uh, can you guys hear me still? Yes, okay. we hear you, yes. Okay, all right, so um, this is the outline of my talk and I'm going to cover quite a lot of topics, so I'm going to skim through some topics that I I, uh, um, uh, I think uh, the audience are more familiar with. So the first slide, a brief history, is this, the slide that I will skip uh, quite a lot, I think. Um, so diffraction theory uh, has been uh, around for hundreds of years, so and uh, I want to start with the Bragg's Law, which uh, is established or, or um, established by the father and son team Bragg's. Uh, this is an important law that leads to the beginning of X-ray crystallography. So about 50 years after Bragg's Law was, um, uh, I guess, discovered, the first protein structures were was determined 50 years later uh, by Max Perus, who determined the structure of the hemoglobin, which is the protein that carries oxygen uh, in our blood, and John Kandrew, uh, John Kandrew determined the structure of myoglobin, which is the structure that carries uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide also in a muscle cell. 
And since then, you can see that there's an exponential growth of the number of experimentally determined protein structures available. And this is one of the reasons, this is an important aspect that made AlphaFold work, because in, uh, in order for uh, neural network, to, um, uh, for AlphaFold to, to work, there needs to be enough experimental data to train the neural network. So um, I will get right into a little bit of background of protein structures. Uh, so this is um, proteins, uh, the instruction or a blueprint for protein production, production in a cell is encoded in DNA in discrete segment called genes. So the DNA molecule is a uh, double helix and each strand it's made up of four different nucleotides, uh, A, C, G, T. So in a process called transcription, the strand of, uh, one of these strand is converted into what's called the mRNA. mRNA ha is made of very similar things as DNA, except for one nucleotide. So at the, uh, from mRNA, then uh, there's a ribosome, a macromolecule, molecular machine called ribosome that uh, converts or that can uh, uh, produce the protein coded by the mRNA. So the code for an amino acid, or actually I should uh, uh, mention that the protein is made of 20 different amino acids, and each amino acid is coded by three nucleotides. So at the mRNA level, the three, every three uh, bases will lead to one amino acid. So I'm going to explain a little bit about the backbone of proteins. So the amino acids are linked, covalently linked to each other by what's called a peptide bond, shown here. Um, so the peptide bonds, the backbones of all amino acids are the same. So it consists of um, these strains of atoms shown here. What's different is what's connected to the C beta atom. So this is where the side, what's so, so called the side chains of an amino acid will attach to. In this example, there are three different amino acids. And so beyond the C beta atom, there will be different chemical groups that's connected here, here, and here. So moving forward, um, there are different hierarchy of protein structure. First, at the first level, we have the primary sequence, the primary structure, which is just a string of um, protein sequence encoded by DNA uh, and is connected by the peptide bonds. The primary structure is folded into secondary structure, which there are only two types, alpha helix, or a beta strand, which is like an arrow, depicted in an arrow like this. And multiple secondary structures can come together to form what's called a motif. So these are recurrent structural motif that's found in um, different proteins. So um, nature uses common structural motifs to build different proteins. And then we have uh, the next level, we have a domain. So domain is basically, if you make the domain artificially in a, in a cell, the, the protein, the, this domain will can self-fold into a independent structure. And most proteins contains more than one domains, and this is called a tertiary structure. So in this example, this protein has three different domains, but it's made of a single polypeptide chain. And then in a, uh, some proteins will have, uh, requires multiple polypeptide chains to form the functional protein. For example, the hemoglobin, the first structure that I mentioned in the history slide, has four polypeptide chains coming together to form a functional hemoglobin. So in that, in the, at this level is the quaternary structure. So why are we interested to solve structures of proteins? So proteins are, the, are essential to life. Um, they are the major molecules that do different 
do many different things in our body to make us live. So the three-dimensional structure of protein, uh, the, the three-dimensional structure of, pro, of a protein dictates its function in a very similar way that the wheel needs a wheel wheels on on cars need to be round the, uh, for uh, to push the car, uh, you know, to generate speed to move move the car. And the shape or the structure of, oops, oh, okay, here we go. The structure of kitchen utensil, in the same way, the sh shape of um, the kitchen utensil determine whether you can use it to scoop liquid or hold food. So, as you all know, um, the light source that you use to analyze structure needs to match the resolution that you want to achieve. For molecules, if you want to go to, uh, to the level of atomic resolution, a typical bond distance is around one to three angstrom. So X-ray has the correct wavelength to achieve atomic resolution. But the problem with X-ray is that there's no refractive lens that can recombine uh, the um, diffracted X-rays, unlike a uh, light microscope where you use um, uh, objective lens to recombine the rays to, uh, to the, the um, diffracted lights to get an image. Uh, and similarly, in an uh, electron microscope, uh, the electrons, the, the, uh, also the electron beam is also diffracted by uh, your sample, but the beams can be refocused by electromagnets. So there's no such, um, there's no refractive, there's no way to um, focus X-rays, and the, the reason is because is because um, all materials, uh, their refractive index of all materials is close to one, uh, which is the wavelength of X-ray. So um, so technically, X-ray crystallography is not really an imaging technique. It is an experimental technique that exploits the fact that X-rays are diffracted by crystals. So now I would like to give you a general overview of how a protein crystallographic project uh, works. So this gives you an outline of um, a crystallographic project. So first you will have a, you start off with a biological question where um, you know that the protein structure will help you answer um, a biological question. So you would go to a database, find the, the gene that encodes the protein, and then you will um, do some molecular biology to engineer the genes into vectors, DNA vectors, which allows you to make the protein in cells artificially. So um, there are, I'm not going to get into the methodology, but there are ways where you can uh, engineer the cloning vector in order to express a lot of the protein, your protein of interest, the protein that you want to solve structures of. So um, once you get an artificial cell to make uh, a lot of your protein, you need to purify the protein because uh, in order to get protein crystals, the protein sample has to be close to 95% pure. So you need to purify the protein and then uh, set up crystallization and hope that you will get some crystals. Once you get good crystals, then you will collect diffraction data. And from the diffraction data, you will do some computational methods to generate an electron density that shows you, that where uh, electron density that allows you to build a model of your of your protein structure. So, um, as far as uh, in terms of application to medicine, uh, structure-based drug design is where you determine the structure of a drug target, and then you can bind. You can um, from the structure, you can uh, use computer-aided design to find compounds that can interact or bind to this. Uh, drug target, what you can do is then solve a structure of the drug binding to the, pro the, the targets, 
And then from the structure, you can design the, um, you know, better, another compound that binds better um, or um, binds better to the structure. And then from there, so from, with the structure, you will go back to the beginning where you will, um, I guess, attempt to grow crystals of the drug target with your new drug lead. And then the cycle uh, continues. Well, over the field, there's uh, quite a lot of uh, engineering effort that improves uh, the field. Uh, I'm going to show a few kind of advancements. Um, uh, so in terms of purification, um, the, there's, uh, this is an automatic system that allows you to purify proteins um, if efficiently. So um, there's, uh, this is the same uh, instrument that my lab has. So this speeds up this process of purifying enough proteins for crystallization. Another technical advancement is the development of nanodrop uh, crystallization robot. So this is the same crystallization robot that my lab has. Um, so these, the, the robot uh, allows, can, can pipette, dispense very small, amount, small volume. So in the old days, uh, in the beginning, in the early days of protein crystallography, most people work on proteins that are naturally um, uh, presence in high abundance. For example, hemoglobin in blood, you can easily purify from original source. But as the field progress, it becomes harder and harder to get enough proteins for crystallization. So uh, crystallization robot is, has, has helped the field quite a lot because you can, uh, you can screen a lot of crystallization condition using a small amount of uh, sample. And finally, um, uh, the advancement of synchrotron light source. And um, so this is the reason why I came to Saskatchewan. So Saskatchewan has the only one um, X-ray uh, generate, uh, facility, facility that generates high brilliance X-rays in Canada. Um, so the way synchrotron works is it has a um, circular structure where electrons uh, spins and goes around in high speeds, and then there are magnets or other techniques that bend the path of the electrons, and that energy is used to generate X-rays. Uh, where uh, in number eight here, this is where you would mount your crystal. You get your X-ray, your high in intense beam shoot your x-ray and you collect your data and then you can um, collect your diffraction data and do your analysis. These days um, you can, well when I was in grad school you actually have to bring your crystal to, to the synchrotron, which is kind of fun because it's kind of like a field trip. But now um, the events, now these days you can uh, just send crystals by FedEx and then you can look at your data on a computer and do all the processing remotely. Okay, so um, next I'm gonna talk a little bit about the process of crystallization. So as I mentioned uh, before, uh, one of the requirements for a successful crystallization experiment is that you need to have a, a large amount of protein sample, the protein that you want to crystallize. It has to be very pure. So in this green tube, this represents the, your pure protein. And then you will have a crystallization cocktail, a crystallization solution, which has precipitants, uh, some additives, deter detergents, um, and other components. The main, uh, the key is that there's an unlimited number of combinations, the limited uh, conditions that you can test. So this creates one of the problems of crystallography. So in, uh, crystallization experiments, what you would do is you pipette a drop of your protein and then you mix it with a drop of your, of the crystallization cocktail. Where you basically, you effectively dilute your protein concentration as well as the crystallization concentration. Then you will seal this drop in a system. So this would be a seal system. And then the drop, your protein mixture and crystallization will sit on a drop 
uh, in a drop like this. What this happens it, is that water will diffuse out from the drop into um, the into the well. So in a way, so what the process basically what you want to do is try to slowly concentrate the protein so that um, in a way that allows crystals to grow. So crystallization is, is kind of an art, and I'll try to explain a little bit more uh, in the next slide. Um, and then this picture is the type of trays that we use uh, for crystallization. So this diagram shows a solubility phase diagram. So on the X is uh, one component of the, uh, of the crystallization uh, solution. In, in increasing concentration, and on the Y is your protein concentration. So in the beginning of the crystallization experiments, your protein, you, you might be in somewhere in this blue zone here. So as the vapor uh, is um, diffused away from the drop into the well, then you're hoping that you're moving close to the green zone. So this is the metastable zone where nucleation and maybe crystal uh, will form. But if the speed is too fast, then you may go, if, if it, it's concentrated too quickly, then you'll get precipitates um, and then you will never get crystals. So you have to, so basically that the reason why you screen a lot of conditions to try to encourage your protein to slowly concentrate uh, in a way that it will crystallize. So crystallization is kind of, uh, as I mentioned, is an art. It, you can view uh, it as a multivariate sampling problem. So in a, there's a database that lists all the biomolecules that, can, that are used for crystallization, and there are over 400 reagents. So you can imagine, and they can be combined in many different ways. So you can imagine the space that you need to search to find the correct, uh, the condition that gives you crystals. So the question is how can you optimally explore this unlimited space to increase the success of your crystallization? So there are many different ways that you can screen for things. So each box uh, represents a different screening design. So you can uh, approach the um, you can approach it in random uh, a random sampling in the red cubes or the random sampling. Where uh, so in the beginning of a crystallization project, when you have no idea what will work, this will be a good strategy to try to sample the space as wide as possible to hope that one of those solutions will get, give you a hit. Or you can um, focus on specific part of the space, like if you know, um, if you know uh, the protein is only stable in a narrow range of pH, then you may not want to screen um, you know, uh, uh, you may want to focus your screen in a more narrow range uh, of pH. Uh, for exa uh, example. So after you set up all the screens, you have to score your setup. This is an example of what you would get in a crystallization experiment. So if you're lucky, you get something like in number three that um, from a screen you can uh, put in a, on a beam or already. But more, most likely, uh, your first attempt may, if you're lucky, you might get something in four or five. You see a little bit, a very tiny crystals that you can fine screen based on the condition that, the, this initial condition. Um, other times you're less likely, your whole tray would be either precipitant, you see only precipitant or um, soluble, uh, empty drops. Um, so if you're lucky and you get a nice crystal, then you will collect a diffraction pattern. And from the diffraction pattern, you can calculate an electron density map, which you can build a protein model. But of course, it's not that simple. In reality, this is the reality, you might end up spending a lot of time doing 
uh, cloning, expre uh, expression, purification, and you never get a crystal. So for example, if you're stuck at this stage and you want to write a grant and say that I want to determine uh, my, uh, I propose to, to de determine the structure of this protein, and all your preliminary data you show is you're purifying in this stage, you will not get money. You will definitely, you will never get any money to if your your grant is to to propose uh, a, um, a protein structure where you don't have crystals. If you have some crystals, but they're not good enough for structure determination, like you're at this stage, you may have a chance to get money depending on uh, the quality of the crystals or um, the type of protein you're trying to get money to solve. Um, but you can still, they can still, um, the reviewer can still shoot you down for, oh, the crystal is not good enough, you'll never get there. So the bottom line is you can, uh, if you're lucky, the first construct you, you get Pure, uh, pure protein right away, you get crystals right away, and you get a structure. It will only cost you 40 bucks, you get a structure. Or if you're unlucky, you might spend over $100,000 without ever getting a, a crystal structure. So what is the, the problem? So one of the, um, the problem of crystallization is that, so a crystal, um, for a, in order for a protein to form a crystal, the protein needs to make interactions with each other. So they have, the crystals are formed by a sparse network of weak intermolecular interactions between the molecules. So if your protein has some inherent uh, disorder, the inherent, uh, inherently uh, are not able to come together, you will never get crystals. So that's one problem. Another problem you could have is you get crystals, but the crystals are not well packed in this example here. So you can see that the blue circles, if they're only blue circles, then they can pack really well. But uh, if you remember in the beginning, I mentioned that it's very important for the protein to be extremely pure. And this is the reason. If you have any impurity in the sample, it will call, it will uh, in, it affect the packing, and the effects of bad packing is will come out in the resolution. So, if you don't have if you have good crystal but not good packing, you will not get um, diffraction that will give you um, a good resolution. So, for for a good well packed crystal, will give you uh, more spots that will give you more details details uh, in the electron density. But if your crystals are not well packed, you will only get a small number of, of spots. It could be some 10 angstrom. I mean, three angstrom is actually not bad. Um, for my PhD project, I was stuck in 10 angstrom for a long time before we made the, the breakthrough to, uh, get, uh, to uh, get better crystals. So, um, how to overcome this, the bottleneck of structural bio, uh, the bottleneck of a structural biology project, in my opinion, um, is mainly in the earliest stage here. So, the computation um, and methodology to solve the structure is quite well established. So, it's, um, the, the trick really is to how to figure out how to get good crystals. And in order to do that, you need to um, understand about chemistry or the biological function of the protein will help you design um, better crystallizable projects at the cloning stage. And this is one of the reasons why I changed field after I did my uh, PhD because I wanted to uh, gain more biological knowledge, which allow, it would allow me to design better structural projects that are um, more likely to, for, um, to, for success. So what will better knowledge help you do? Uh, one way is um, that you, you, if, you can, if you know there are regions of the protein that 
will prevent the protein from coming together to form a crystal. You can remove those regions, but then you need to have enough knowledge to understand that removing those regions will not affect the function of the protein. Another technique um, that you can do is to identify binding partners. So this would require cell bio more cell biology and um, study to know what protein um, uh, interacts with another uh, your protein of interest. Because sometimes protein, one protein on its own may be flexible um, and then it never crystallized. But if you uh, join it with its binding partner, then it will become a, a stable uh, structure that is uh, more uh, feasible for uh, to form crystals. Another thing you can do is to mutate surface residues. So if you are uh, can predict the structure. So this is the place where alpha fold, um, that if it, alpha fold can predict uh, protein structure close enough. Um, I mean, it doesn't have to be accurate. If it's close enough to identify surface residues, then we can identify the surface that will inhibit, when we know will inhibit crystallization to make the protein more crystallizable. So, um, yeah, so this is one area where alpha fold uh, could potentially help protein crystallography. Okay, so before I talk about another area where alpha fold can help with protein crystallography, I need to go through a few fundamental concepts in um, crystallography. Okay, so first of all, uh, crystals, protein crystals, as I mentioned, is basically um, uh, proteins packed into a regular periodic uh, arrangement. So in a 2D level, so if the protein here is packed in a crystal, you can draw a uh, unit lattice to, um, I guess, uh, the, um, explain, kind of uh, categorize the repeating units. So a lattice is just a guidelines or a, a construct that divides the space equally. It's not a real, it's just an artificial um, uh, a construct. So of course in 3D, uh, crystals are 3D. Um, in 3D, the unit cell will have three dimensions. So unit cell has three edges, A, B, and C, and also three angles associated with the axes. So the uh, important point here is that for proteins, there are 65 different space groups, uh, which means uh, um, space groups are different types of lattice properties and symmetry. So because proteins are um, chiral, uh, a chiral, so they cannot have Im mirror images, there are only 65 space groups possible for protein crystals. So the first requirements to solve uh, determine uh, crystal structure is to figure out the correct crystal symmetry um, in, in your crystal. The next concept I want to introduce is it's the concept of reciprocal lattice and Miller indices. So this basically um, for uh, crystal, to understand uh, crystal diffraction, um, uh, this will help you understand where, where to get the diffraction spots. So Miller indices or reciprocal lattice, basically if you can cut, you can cut a unit cell by these planes. These planes are similar to, it's identical to the, the plane in uh, Bragg's law. So you can cut the crystals in many different ways. And uh, for example, if you look at this blue line here, so this plane cuts um, the A, cuts the A axis in half, and it cuts the, the B axis uh, come in, uh, in one unit. So the Miller index for this blue plane is 2, 1. So the, the integer describes how many times this plane, this particular plane will cut the crystal axis. 
So you can, uh, so it's only, Miller indices are only integral, in, uh, only integers, and it describes how many times the plane cuts a, a cell axis. So of course, in um, three dimension, you will have uh, all these different planes. So you can describe the, um, Miller indices is basically the, uh, this is HKL, describes so um, how many times, so let's explain this. This one has a Miller index of one, one, and one. What that means is this plane will cut the A, a um, C axis, the A axis one, uh, one unit, B axis one unit, and C axis one unit. So if you plot these uh, Miller indices, you will get a reciprocal lattice. So this, this is a slide that I'm gonna skip you will get a reciprocal lattice, which is shown in this grid here. So each dot, this is, um, uh, each dot will have, has, will have a, is a Miller ind index. So this, in a diffraction experiment, the crystal is mounted on a, um, on, in this axis that allows a rotation. So you will rotate the, the crystal in a diffraction experiment. S0 is this where the X-ray beam will shoot. And then on the side, we'll, you will have an area detector to collect the diffraction pattern. The circle is an artificial um, thing that you draw. So the, uh, it's called the Ewart sphere. Um, this allows us to, you to visualize the condition when Bragg's law is, um, is uh, met. So, uh, you can see here that as to basically um, the Miller index, the reciprocal lattice lattices, if it if it intersects with the Ewart sphere, this is when Bratz, the Bratz condition is met, and you will get a diffraction spot at this point. I hope this is um, clear enough for you to understand that um, the diffraction pattern, the location of the spot tells you about the symmetry of the crystal, but the intensity of the spot tells you about what's inside the crystal. Now, this is an equation of um, electron density. This is what you want to get um, when you solve structures. So you want to get um, electron density in um, X, Y, Z uh, across your whole unit cell. And um, to get this function, you need to sum, you need to sum um, all the scattering factors. So this is a wave function in, with all the possible planes. Um, so I want to uh, point your attention to, I mean, I'm not gonna explain to you the equation, uh, but what we need to, the key uh, parameters that is required to generate the electron density is the structure factor and the phase. So this is the amplitude and, and the phase, basically. In a diffraction experiment, we are measuring the intensity is proportional to the amplitude. So we can measure the amplitude, but the phase is lost. So this is what's called the crystallographic phase problem. So there are many ways to solve the phase problems, uh, one way is to introduce a marker atom substructure that will, that have different uh, diffraction um, property, X-ray diffraction property. So, um, so first you have a, a, your native crystal that, that, ha, that contains the structure you want to solve, you, and then you generate a diffraction pattern. What you need to do is generate another crystal that is identical, except that you have a marker atom substructure. So this addition does not change the symmetry of the crystal. The only thing it will change is the intensity of the spots. So you can use the differences in intensity to find a location of this marker atom substructure, and this would be your experimental phase. So another, uh, Technique to find your phase is called molecular replacement. This is a technique you can use when you have a structure that is similar 
to the structure, uh, if, uh, the, uh, similar to the protein that you're trying to solve. So I, I, I guess you, you can uh, imagine that um, this is related to a uh, benefit of alpha fo is if alpha fo can predict a uh, structure close enough, then it will help us find phases using molecular replacement. But traditionally, without prediction, uh, we would use a protein that uh, may be from a different species to, um, so, and is expected to have similar structure to help us find phase. So in order to explain how this works, this, uh, so there are many, again, many different ways to, uh, many different methods for molecular replacement. But the simplest method that I can explain easily is called a, a searching in Patterson vector space. So what a Patterson function is that it is a map that uh, contains all the interatomic distance information. To generate this map, you only need the amplitude of your um, uh, of your uh, data. So basically, your you just need the native data. Uh, data you only need the intensity, and you can generate a Patterson function. So first, um, this is an example. So this would be your search model, the three dots. And B, this is a Patterson function uh, showing the interatomic distance of the these three dots. Okay, and then C and D is the homologous structure that you want to solve. So, um, and then so this is the location of this structure in this axis, and D is the uh, Patterson function of your um, unknown structure. So when you just compare B and D, um, the first step in molecular placement is you, you want to do a rotation search using Patterson map. So basically, you will rotate the two maps until you find an overlap. In this case, the rotation, the correct rotation is 40 degrees. And of course, um, we have to do this in three dimension. So once you find a cross rotation, the correct rotation, then the second step is to find a correct translation. So if you can uh, uh, find a translation, correct translation, then you have solved the phase uh, using this search model by molecular replacement. So um, the last step in protein crystallography, so you have your, uh, is to build your model. So basically, you have your observed diffraction data. You either get your phase from experimental phase, where you introduce a marker atom, or from molecular replacement phases. You will get your first electron density. And then uh, from the density, you will build your model to your density. And there's some refinement uh, uh, you can do to kind of fit the model better in the electron density. So you will go through this process until the model or the map doesn't improve anymore. And then finally, there will, um, at uh, the end of the project, you need to validate your structure. You need to evaluate how accurate your structure is. And then uh, based on the structure, then you can uh, explain the function of your protein. So now I'm going to give you an example of how protein structures unravel how a macromolecular machine works. So this is, um, I'm going to talk about uh, my uh, PhD work. So to introduce to you spliceosome, I'm coming, bringing back this slide, which is a um, uh, how proteins are made. So in eukaryotic, eukaryotic genes, uh, uh, for example, human human genes, the genes, are, the codes for the protein is actually interrupted by non-coding regions. So there's an extra step in, eukary in eukaryotes is that the, the introns need to be removed um, to before the mature uh, uh, mRNA can be translated into proteins. And this I can mean is five minutes more. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, so this is um, what the splice, maybe I would skip this then, actually. I need to go to, yeah, let's just skip this. Okay. All right, so let's go right into alpha <laughs> So 
this is uh, the reason why Valeria asked me to give this talk. Um, so in 2020, the deep learning based algorithm AlphaFold that predicts protein structures generated a lot of buzz because it did exceptionally well in an annual protein prediction competition. Um, AlphaFold. So when this came out, I got a lot of calls from my friends and they're asking, well, are, are you going to lose your job? Uh, you know, they all, all these can be predicted already. Well, I still have my job, um, but it is actually, it is very exciting to, to the field. Um, so I'm going to explain to my best, uh, I'll try to explain how this works um, to my best of my ability. So basically the same group, so 2020, the first algorithm came out and generated a lot of buzz. This year, summer, they, they improved the algorithm and improved the uh, prediction once again. And, um, and so basically the central component is a convolutional, a conv convolutional neural network that is trained on PDB structures, so experimental structures to predict the distances between uh, residue pairs. So uh, before I continue, I want to remind you the protein structures. So, um, so the side chains, the differences, basically C beta uh, would be, be uh, in all the chemical groups that are connected to this C beta. Okay, so the idea is that in a folded structure, some residues that are far apart in the primary sequence will have close contacts. So, so you have, um, the idea is that you have your input sequence. This is the protein primary sequence of a known structure. The, what the first, uh, component is the multi multiple sequence alignment, which contains the primary sequence of protein from different species. So the useful information here is that if there's a correlation, uh, uh, chain, if the two residues are connected with each other far away, the evolutionary change should have similar property. So for example, if one residue is positive in three dimensional, it's a positive charge residue. It interacts with another residue far away on, in the primary sequence, and that residue is negative charge. If you look at the multiple sequence alignment, the change, um, even though the residue will change, but the positive and negative charge will remain. And the, the second important piece is the 2D distance matrix right here that give information on the distance prediction. And then another thing is the structure database search. So this is their experimental structure, it's a template. So all these is fed into a, um, this neural network to be trained. So I'm gonna explain the next bit um, with not so much, um, hopefully some of you will understand more than me. So the first uh, neural network is a uh, evil evil form of block, which contains a number of novel attention-based and non-attention-based components. So they are able to uh, find a mechanism to exchange information with the uh, multiple sequence alignment and the pair representations that allow direct reasoning about the spatial, spatial would come from this 2D matrix and evolutionary relationships. And then they have another, uh, so then um, they have another neural network which introduces a 3D structure in the form of rotation and translation. If you remember from the structure of the um, proteins, there are some angles that can rotate, but there are certain constraints because there are, the atoms can be clashing into each other. So based on these, uh, principles, they were able to build this alpha fold, the second version, to uh, predict structures to, at a higher level. And then a month later, um, that was very interesting, so this paper uh, came out a month later, and the authors are a bunch of structural biologists who were intrigued by the 
AlphaFold uh, results. So I should mention that AlphaFold was done by a group of scientists in Google, and they didn't release their algorithms. So the structural biologists took their ideas and they implemented their ideas and generated another algorithm called RosettaFold. So because these uh, investigators are structural biologists, so they went a step ahead to test whether the predictive structure is useful for solving molecular replacement. And sure enough, um, they were able to, the, in their predictive structure, uh, they were able to solve some molecular replacement uh, structure that was not possible using the closest homo homologous structure. So in terms of prediction, it is still not as good as alpha fold, but um, this Rosetta fold is a lot faster. Um, so lastly, I want to uh, talk about a structure-based, uh, some COVID, uh, uh, structure related to COVID. Um, this is a uh, protein that is very important for the coronavirus to replicate. So uh, um, naturally, it's an it's a attractive drug target. So this movie is, um, uh, you will see this inhibitor binding to this protein. And then I'm going to try to rotate this. So this protein is important for coronavirus to survive. And uh, this group um, solved the structure of this protein. And then from the structure, they use computer aided, uh, a computer aided method to find this inhibitor. And then they did another structural project to uh, show how this inhibitor binds to this protein. So in a minute, so you see it rotates, and then um, in the next view, we will zoom into the inhibitor. And then, uh, so the protein is shown in, you can see the secondary structures. And uh, in the next little bit, I will, I'm not showing the side chains yet. Uh, in the next few seconds, you will see the side chains coming up. So these are the side chains of the, this protein that interacts with this inhibitor. And, and a little bit later, this, the mesh is what the electron density look like. Okay, so uh, the final slide, um, so obviously deep Mind uh, the groups that uh, wrote AlphaFold also try to predict a lot of protein structures associated with COVID-19, and this is one of the results. The AlphaFold, the blue structure is predicted uh, by AlphaFold, and the green structure is an experimental structure that came out later on. You can see that there's some good overlaps, but there's also some, uh, you know, errors in the prediction. So I guess uh, to, to close my um, assessment is that I, I am very excited with um, these uh, high level predict, prediction because it really would help us push forward um, protein crystallography projects. Um, however, I don't think it's good enough that I'll be uh, out of my job in any time soon. So I'm gonna end here. This is a list of references I used for this talk um, for uh, slides that I don't have room to put references. And um, finally, I'd like to dedicate this talk to my PhD supervisor and my uh, colleague, Chris Ubridge. Both of them recently passed away. And uh, one of the reasons that I was able to kind of give this talk is that I wrote a, uh, a dedication review for, for them. And so I was kind of quite um, in tune with crystallography because otherwise I might not be able to give this talk today. So um, that's it. Sorry, I hope I didn't go too much over time. Thank you so much, Adeline. No, don't worry. Thanks a lot. Uh, so let me check if there are questions ready for you. Uh, as I said before, you can write down your questions in the chat and I can also translate them for you if you need, especially for the students. Um, perhaps I have a question to start with. Uh, I think this, uh, well, I have a couple of questions actually. Uh, mm -hmm. The first one is, 
Uh, if you can, you explain very well what are all the implications and all the difficulties of this, of the experimental pathway for crystallization and for determining structures of proteins. But could you help us as, you know, as common people, people on the street that are not, you know, uh, very familiar to this field, to understand why is it so fundamental for us to, to understand pro uh, protein structures? So what are the benefits? Uh, for the common people. So I'm a person on the street and uh, there is a, a protein that needs to be uh, defined in terms of structures. So how far are these things? Why is it useful for me? Yes, so I, I guess um, I'll come back to this car and, and utensil <laughs> picture. So in um, basically the shape of the protein atomic level would determine the function of the protein. So let's say it's an enzyme. There's an enzyme that's supposed to catalyze a chemical reaction. So in order for that to happen, the atoms have to be at the right place. Like say, let's say the reaction is to cut something and the cutting requires these atoms to be in this three-dimensional space. So without that, with this knowledge, with the structural knowledge, three-dimensional knowledge, you know that exactly this is the atom that will cut this particular uh, protein, if it's a protease. So to know the atomic level will allow you to understand the mech mechanism of protein structure. Now at the level, at the end of the talk, I talk about the drug design implication, right? Um, if we go back to uh, the end, this is a structure of a coronavirus uh, protein, right, that is important for its survival. So now we all want to find drugs to kill the virus. And basically this, this great molecule is what can bind to this viral protein. And there, there are cellular data to show that this inhibitor actually has, can kill, uh, can prevent um, uh, uh, the virus from damaging cells. So that is the very practical reason. So, and then now how do you improve this? So obviously this, this structure was uh, done in the beginning of the pandemic and we haven't heard any, anything about a potential drug yet. So obviously it's not working well enough yet. So from the structure, you can see, oh, well, maybe I can make this better by building, oh, there's a space here. I can build another group here. So it's kind of, I like to see protein structure uh, like um, Lego that my, kid, my son likes to play. Um, so each piece, like your, your, you can think of a drug as a Lego piece, um, and then your protein is another Lego. And there's a part that you need to block. So when you don't see the structure, when you see the structure, you know exactly, okay, I can block it, I can add a part here to block it, or, uh, you know, take away this part. If I take away this part, maybe this part is sticking out. Maybe if I remove it, it would make the drug better. I see, I see. So, so somehow also we can say that uh, being a little less precise, as you said, at least for the moment, but much faster, uh, it, it can allow you to, to work in parallel many, in many times, in many directions for the, the, the correct prediction of a protein. And so uh, it, it somehow makes it faster on, on a general you know, scale, on a general perspective, the, the, the solution of the protein structure and the, the, the design yeah, of mean, drugs. Even you know, yeah, for personalized medicine, you know, yes, yeah, so personalized medicine, like for example, if there's a mutation, you have a, this person has a mutation that leads to a disease, you can look at how this mutation affects the structure and then figure out how you can fix it, you know, mm -hmm. something like that. that. That sounds fantastic. Far away, perhaps, but fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Uh, so I read this one first and then I'll ask you my last one if I, we have time. Okay. Uh, so Dr. Campos has, is asking, uh, in the 3D structural representations of proteins, what does the thinner and the thicker threads, the blue ones, mean? Thanks for the talk. This one. <laughs> so this one, you mean this one? This one? I, I, 
Yes, yes, it, said, yeah. okay, yeah, so, so, um, so this is beta strand. So this is just a cartoon representation of the secondary structure of proteins. Um, if I, um, so you can see these ribbons, this, these are helix, these are the alpha helix, and then you can see that these are called strands. And so these are common, these are the only two types of sec, uh, secondary structure in proteins. So it's quite amazing, you know, you start with a, primary sequence of protein, and they will either fold into helix or um, a strand like this. And then um, in three-dimensional, they will fold into this type of structure. And that's why um, you have to, uh, that's why that in the, in alpha fold, the pair of distance, the prediction of distance between all the uh, amino acids is important because you can see here, there's a, there may be a connection here, but in the primary sequence, they are very far away. Did I, did I answer that question in terms of beta strand and alpha helix? Is the question answered? <laughs> Let me ask. So they, these are basically representing the, as a cartoon representation of just the backbone of the, of the protein. Um, I can go back to, here. So the backbone of the protein, this is the backbone. So we are ignoring the, the, the extra chemical groups that connects to the C beta. So if you just look at the backbone there, only um, secondary structure, that's why you only see the ribbon or the beta strand on the cartoon. Okay, so the, the researcher says that we see this representation often for the proteins, yeah. and he was curious to understand what what was the meaning of yeah, that. yeah. So it's yeah. So I guess if you, um, uh, it's basically the backbone conformation. It's a different. So this one, the the backbone is more straight. It's it's kind of parallel, and oh, this is anti-parallel. The backbone exactly looks parallel if you look if you if we ex, uh, expand it into atom atomic structure. Whereas the backbone of the helix, it will be exactly it will it will spin will rotate like a um, corkscrew or your wine opener. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, well, I'll ask another one. I think we are over time, but my last one, I guess. Um, is there any relationship that you see between alpha fold, the potentiality of alpha fold, and the use of uh, cryoelectron uh, microscopy? Yes, yes, I didn't get into that. So cryoelectron microscopy also generated a lot of buzz because the resolution is approaching um, X-ray crystallography. So in the paper that um, Rosetta Fold, they also they also use their predicted structure to see if they can fit into the electron microscope uh, density, and they were able to. So it also benefits that as well. Okay. So well, if there is no more questions. Uh, I think we, we, we are very thankful. Thank you so much, Adeline, for the talk. I think it was very interesting and somehow it teaches us something that is coming in the next future and very likely, hopefully, will improve our lives and our, the, the, the medical treatment for many of our things. Uh, we thank so much. Yeah. We will send you an, an alone, uh, like a, a piece of paper, like a acknowledgement, I'd say, very soon. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no, thank you for um, giving, me the, giving me this opportunity to talk about protein crystallography. I love, um, I love structural work and um, it's my passion. And sorry that I went a little bit over time. <laughs> no, don't worry, don't worry. Look, it's just five minutes later now and, and I, I've asked too many questions. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs> Gracias a todos. Eh, hasta luego, hasta el próximo viernes. Thanks, Adeline. Thanks a lot. Okay.